Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Have We Got Planning News For You? Welcome, indeed, to episode two of series six. Who would have ever have believed that we'd be going this long? Anyway, we hope you're all safe and well. It's great that we're now in February, um, and uh, one hopes that you're all partying and nightclubbing again, just like ev- everyone else. What a week it's been. I tell you what, reports are coming out thick and fast, aren't they? One minute it's Sue Gray, and then we have the levelling up white paper, all 332 pages of it. Well, that, that, that'll that be something for us to get our teeth stuck into in a future episode. Meanwhile, as ever, we are here to inform and entertain you whilst also raising money for charity. And so please make whatever donation you feel uh, is appropriate to whichever charity um, you are able to, to make it to. So aside from our usual four topical cases uh, uh, this week, we are delighted to welcome as our very special guest, the president of the Planning Officers Society, Victoria Keegan. Welcome, Victoria, to the show. Um, Would you like to uh, start off by telling us where you're speaking from, what you're drinking, and also, Victoria, what your theme is and why you've chosen it? Thank you. So I am um, speaking from Snaresbrook out on the central line in London in Zone 4, for all those that haven't heard where Snaresbrook is. Um, My theme for the day is Spain. Uh, Why do you ask me that? Well, having been put on the spot yesterday by five barristers, it was the first thing that came to my mind as I crumbled under the weight of (laughs) cross-examination. But the real reason is because I need a holiday in the sun and I've just booked one to Granada. So it was the first thing that popped into my head. And um, my tipple for the day is um, a fine glass of Alberino from Galicia. Um, But unfortunately, I've got to drive the car after this. So I've got it stored up to drink later after the uh, later on this evening. Well, that's wonderful, Victoria, uh, uh, and we very much look forward to Sasha's interview with you in the second half of the show. Um, so uh, meanwhile, everybody, hello, it's me again, Mary Cook. Um, I'm not in the town legal office, as you may have gathered. I am actually up in the uh, wonderful French Alps in Val d'Isere, where I've been having a lovely time skiing. And I'm afraid to say that the local spa shop here doesn't stretch to anything other than French goods and I've not been able to I've not been able to find so much as a uh, Spanish beer so currently I'm on the water but I sincerely hope someone's going to bring me a gin and tonic very soon Um, meanwhile over to you Paul would you like to say hello introduce yourself I absolutely would. Hello, Mary. Hello, Victoria. Hello, everybody. Um, Victoria, uh, very welcome. I have to say I'm in Lancashire doing an inquiry in Gloucestershire uh, as virtual inquiries start tail, tailing off. Um, but it also means I'm at home, as you can see from behind me. But that means that I get orders and I get direct orders. So when my wife is on a train saying I'm going to be late, I'm not able to order uh, to open a bottle of Estrella Galicia, uh, nor indeed the, to open the bottle of Rioja that I was going to open with a glass of wine, because I've just been told I'm picking my 17-year-old up as soon as we've finished. So tragically, I'm having a cup of coffee. Cheers. <laughs> The joys, the joys of parenthood, darling. That's what it is. I'll let you know, Sasha, Mary. Yeah, yeah. Sasha, how are you? I'm very well. I'm in town. I'm in Fleet Street. And I, I Victoria slightly gave me the heebie-jeebies talking about Snaresbrook. I remember one of my first ever briefs. Paul thinks he's the king of the criminal courts. But I must admit, I once went to Snaresbrook Crown Court to prosecute a man who had 65 dogs in his back garden, and it still brings me out in a cold sweat, one <laughs> against a local solicitor who, who knew how to... All those names in criminal evidence and procedure, which do nothing but bamboozle you completely, the cases. So Snaresbrook is not one of my happy places. But anyway, I also I think Victoria's choice of Spain is brilliant. We have to honour Rafa Nadal's 21 major singles titles which is quite incredible and um it's very very good choice but you've also hurt my feelings because of a Yang, the arsenal star player went to spain this week and unfortunately went to barcelona but james um, shame. james sasha <laughs> well it's lovely to see you looking so uh, smart in your very uh, 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 sporting shirt so chris over to you how are you hello hello mary uh, hello vicky hello everyone I am in my childhood bedroom in Droitwich in the West Midlands. Why am I here? Why am I in my childhood bedroom, which is pretty small, actually? 
Uh, I'm here because my examination in public uh, in the Greater Norwich Local Plan finished a little bit early when we suddenly decided not to promote our new settlements at about nine o'clock last night. So uh, I managed to rush back and get back uh, to my mum's house because it's my mum's 82nd birthday. Wow. Well, well, we all say happy birthday to your mum, Chris. Yeah, yeah. And and look, look, here's the family. Oh. That's my mum with my dad, sadly uh, departed. This little girl over here grew up to be a planning officer. That's my sister, Kate, who's a planning officer in Chepstow, just over the border. Haven't had to cross-examine her yet. (laughs) Uh, This little one uh, is my brother, James. He moved to Australia. He's now an Australian citizen and he's a chartered surveyor. And this fat baby in the middle became a planning barrister. Oh, <laughs> now, that is so the, cute. In terms of the Spanish theme, me and Paul always go to Waitrose. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Estrella and Galicia, but I have to drive home. But I'm not going to avoid having a little bit of champagne with my mum. Well, that's lovely. And is that uh, some horses uh, uh, in, in the, the picture? That's, a, that's, yeah. a, that's probably something I made when I was about seven. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a call. How very, very charming. How very, very charming. Well, on the theme of families, um, you will have noticed, keen audience, that the lovely Charlie Banner is not physically uh, present because he is actually with his youngest daughter uh, on his way to Italy right now. But thanks to the wonders of modern technology and in particular the, uh, the wonders of Rob, our IT consultant, we are able to, in fact... Uh, hear from Charlie, um, who starts our case summaries, taking us to the Court of Appeal and a rather um, sad case, actually, about a little boy called Matthew with severe health problems. Um, So over to you, Charlie, and your case summary. Hi, everybody. Uh, Gutted not to be joining you live. Uh, uh, Currently, as you watch, I'm on a plane uh, and contrary to what Paul suggests, it isn't a private jet um, and it doesn't have Wi-Fi. So I'm having to pre-record my uh, case report. And the case that I'm going to be talking about is um, uh, a court of appeal judgment reversing the High Court judgment of Mr Justice Fordham in a judicial review of the Environment Agency. Uh, and the case is, it's, it's, its main interest in the planning context is in relation to enforcement, uh, because the case was brought um, officially by a five-year-old boy, but in, in practice uh, by his uh, mother, who was concerned with the effect uh, of on pollution from a landfill site um, near which they lived. Uh, and their concern was that the Environment Agency ought to be taking um, uh, enforcement action uh, to prevent the, the pollution from this quarry. Um, and the High Court, uh, Mr Justice Fordham, had held that although there wasn't an existing breach of the Environment Agency's legal duties and the legal duties of question were under the Human Rights Act, the right to life and uh, similar obligations on the Human Rights Act that the, the agency were bound by as a public authority, though they hadn't breached them thus far, that there would be a breach in future uh, unless the agency um, contemplated enforcement action. The judge set out a, a direction as to what the agency needed to consider um, and in what time scale. Uh, and the Court of Appeal um, allowed the Environment Agency appeal. It said it wasn't for um, the court in a judicial review application to preempt the discretion of, of the agency as the enforcing body uh, as to what steps it needed to take, and nor is it for the court to um, effectively assume that were the agency not to take particular action, that would be a breach of the Human Rights Act, because that would be the court effectively stepping beyond its role as the reviewing body of the public authority and really stepping into the shoes as the as to, of the decision maker itself. Um, so quite an important case, and uh, assuming it doesn't go any further to the Supreme Court, um, and that's not a pitch for work, by the way, uh, team, uh, but assuming it doesn't go any further to the Supreme Court, um, I think it does have implications in, in the planning enforcement context. Um, I mean, it's it's rare, but not unique, um, to find a planning situation where it's said that if enforcement action isn't taken, there could be a human rights issue. I and mean, there have been cases to do with... Um, environmental pollutive effects, for example, of coal mines. I'm thinking, for example, of the Condron case in uh, next to the Fossifran uh, mine in South Wales being one of them. And 
it, this case makes it much harder for somebody to seek to go to the courts and to force an authority to take enforcement action, um, because it seems to me, in light of this judgment, the courts within the planning context, just they did in the environmental context, uh, in, in this case, say it's not for them to prejudge or preempt what the decision maker uh, must decide. Uh, their job is to wait for the decision maker to make the decision and then review the legality of it afterwards. So a case of, of some interest in the planning enforcement uh, context. We'll see if it goes to the Supreme Court. Back to you, Mary, as my uh, replacement host, no doubt doing a far better job than I would. Greetings from Italy. As if I could ever replace Charlie Banner. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Rob. That was absolutely seamless. So next, uh, we're off to... Beautiful South Wales and Pembrokeshire and to a caravan park. And Chris is going to talk us through this High Court challenge. Over right. to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Mary. I am. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the, the coast of Wales, something I'm very fond of, actually. If you go to your mum's house, you find all the photographs. We used to go here. That's the Maldak Estuary near Barmouth, or as we call it, Wolverhampton-on-Sea. And um, this is about a caravan park, uh, of which is a major issue throughout Wales. Uh, the case is... The Queen on the application of SPVRG, which isn't easy to say, but it's an acronym for the Local Action Group uh, against Pembrokeshire County Council. And it was in the High Court in Cardiff uh, and heard by Mr Justice Stein. Now, uh, it's a judicial review into a decision by Pembrokeshire County Council to grant planning permission for a Section 73 application uh, in relation to an established caravan park at Heritage Way, Pleasant Valley, Narbuth, which, as many of you all know, is near the beautiful town of Tembe. Mm. Um, it was just an application to vary two conditions relating to um, what was going to be proposed there. But this is a very, very long case because a lot of these caravan sites in Wales have a long, long history. And this one was absolutely no exception. Uh, the claimant's challenge was actually on 18 grounds. And can I just thank Sasha for giving me that to do in a week in which... <laughs> I've had an appeal and an EIP, although that suddenly got a lot easier yesterday. <laughs> uh, I've enjoyed reading it for the last two days, and I think I've got it. Uh, and if I can summarise it in the next <laughs> in the next two minutes, <laughs> right? Uh, it's three decisions, um, and they challenge not just the, uh, to the the most recent 2001 planning permission to vary the conditions, but they realised if they wanted to get anywhere, they had to attack the original permission upon which it was based, was back in 2016, and actually have a go at an even earlier permission. Now, the court ruled that out at the permission, permission stage, said you're not challenging the earlier one. So immediately their challenge is significantly curtailed to just these two conditions. And it was all the usual things that we see in court. Uh, if you're thinking of grounds of challenge, then this is a good one because it's got everything for everyone in there. It's got the decision was taken in ignorance of relevant considerations. And that was principally an earlier permission, which I'll come on to in the next half an hour, uh, and then deal rationally with visual amenity, failing to properly take account of policy, ignored relevant considerations, flood risk and so on. Now, how do I summarise all this? Basically, the facts in one minute. The council granted planning permission in 1987 for a complete change, and they created the Step Aside Industrial Heritage Project, no doubt to create a kind of tourist attraction. And with that, the hope was it would get rid of all the previous planning permissions for these caravans and all the parking. But the question was, was that actually ever implemented? All the questions about, well, uh, the car parking was put in, but the sewage works weren't approved. And so there's a whole legal issue surrounding that, which I imagine the judge absolutely welcomed and enjoyed right to the end. Um, and then um, there was a bird park permission in 1991 uh, for a bird park, whatever that is, uh, a 2001 permission. Uh, which was for more caravans, then a 2016 permission, which was the, the main one really that they, they were trying to attack, which was to replace 95 static caravans, 55 touring caravans with 132 static pitches because people just bring on their giant caravans after they've slowed you down on the M4 for hours. OK, and then um, what happened was the, they challenged the 2001 permission, which is all they had permission for, uh, all they had permission for to challenge and said the council were at fault for failing to take into account the 1987 heritage permission 
And the court said, no, it wasn't relevant, accepted evidence from the chief planning officer that it wasn't relevant. Uh, they tried to suggest it, it was uh, inappropriate for him to give that evidence, but the court considered it admissible and took into account the fact that that permission for the heritage park was completely irrelevant. It might have wiped the slate clean and got rid of the caravans on the site, but it was never implemented. And uh, even if it was implemented, which is highly questionable, it wasn't relevant to this decision. Now, there are uh, about 17 other grounds, but I'm not going to cover those. I think we'd all like to hear more about Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. Well, now it falls to me to, um, to tell you all about uh, my appeal this week, which comes from a, a, a location not a million miles away from Rochester. Rochester was one of three Medway towns that I had the pleasure of living in as an army um, child growing up in um, three Medway towns. Anyway, this is a case um, brought by Squaw Developments who were promoting 72 homes on arable fields. And really the moral of this case is uh, it just serves to remind us that um, inspectors can sometimes find conflict with policies which are not mentioned in the reasons for refusal, but which, of course, are nevertheless relevant. And in this particular case, there was a, a spatial uh, policy, S1, which was all about focusing uh, invest reinvestment into the urban fabric. Um, perhaps not surprising in a place like Medway, you may think. And that policy referred to outward peripheral expansion onto fresh land being, I quote, severely restricted, which the inspector uh, quite rightly understood um, to be a policy which was seeking to resist any greenfield development. This policy, surprisingly, was not cited in the reasons for refusal. But as the inspector said, and I quote, it doesn't alter its relevance. And so he found um, conflict with it. There was also a, a, an, another policy, um, BNE25, which uh, governed the approach to development in the countryside, set out a number of exceptions, and, and unsurprisingly, um, a proposal for 72 homes didn't fall within any of uh, those exceptions. Um, Rob, would you like to put up the plan um, of the site? Because the site abutted the rear gardens of some houses, um, and it'll just give you a sense if Rob has that, of the location. So there we have um, the site edged in red. And you can see that other than um, some houses immediately to the east, it's, it, it's effectively surrounded by um, countryside. And one of the um, principal issues that the inspector had about, about this site was its accessibility. And again, it wasn't a reason for refusal that the council took um, a, 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 any point on accessibility, but there were local residents who um, were against the proposal and um, they led quite a lot of evidence about the uh, inadequacies as they saw it of local public transport. And the inspector um, was with them essentially on this point. And the policy requirement was that the site had to, quote, um, secure a realistic chance of access by a range of transport modes. And the inspector found that although there was a, a co-op on a primary school, um, they were on the cusp, he said, of reasonable walking distances. And he criticized, um, it seemed to me, the main parties because they had agreed um, distances, but those distances were crow fly distances. They were not um, actual walking route distances. And um, that was an, another factor which contributed to him concluding that, in fact, um, the public transport wouldn't provide a realistic alternative to the car for most journeys. The proposal also included a nursery, but the inspector felt that the nursery wasn't actually centred on the development and, in, and would indeed just simply add as an attractor um, to local trips. The site um, was within an area of local landscape importance, which formed a green buffer, he said. You can see that from the, the screen. Thank you very much, Rob. There was a great deal of uh, landscape evidence led. And interestingly, in this particular case, after uh, the party's uh, landscape witnesses had given their evidence um, 
a new document emerged, and that new document was a landscape capacity and sensitivity study, which which um, was part of the evidence base for an emerging local plan. But the inspector saw no reason why he shouldn't take that into account, and he gave the parties the opportunity to make written reps about about that. Um, and, and he concluded that the proposal would appear as a large, low-density suburban housing estate in the open countryside. So he was against it in terms of uh, its impact on local policy and also 174 of the MPPF. So, again, no highway reason for refusal. But again, the local community were raising concerns uh, 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 and the inspector concluded that there was a lack of certainty in his mind that access would be safe for all users. So just another reminder about how um, powerful local uh, and indeed sometimes successful local objectors can be. The other interesting point that was taken here was in relation to housing land supply. There was an agreed lack of a five-year housing land su supply. There was an issue about the extent of the shortfall. Um, the inspector felt that the figures were quite significant. But one of the points that the um, appellant took was that although the requirement had to be uh, um, taken using the standard methodology because the local plan was over five years old, the appellant was suggesting that one should add in a shortfall. There had been a historic shortfall and the appellant was suggesting that applying the planning practice guidance, you should add in that shortfall. And the inspector uh, was against the appellant on that ground and said that um, there was nothing in paragraph 74 footnote 39 of the MPPF on that point and that he he considered that the planning practice guidance was quite clear that past under delivery was not a factor that should be added in and so he um he found against the appellant uh, uh, on that basis and uh, applying the tilted balance um he nevertheless dismissed the appeal so um that's me done now the lovely Mr. Tucker is going to take us to Doncaster. There's nothing wrong with Doncaster. My maternal grandparents were married in Doncaster. Um, never, su so, never suggested there was, my darling. Well, there, there is, unfortunately, a, a, an absence of facilities for dead people in Doncaster, because I'm going to deal with uh, a crematorium case, a proposal for a private crematorium, uh, which was the last one standing in terms of an appellant, in terms of appellant, of three proposals that have gone before Doncaster Council, or Donny, as we know it in our neck of the woods. <laughs> and Donny Council uh, had granted permission for one of the crematoria, uh, which glories in the name of Barnby Dunn. Can you just imagine a crematorium where the last name is Dunn? You're done for, lad. Anyway, Barnby Dunn gets consented. Um, one of the other ones gets refused. The final crematorium goes to appeal. Uh, where uh, my junior on the case that I'm currently doing at the moment, the uh, lovely Mr. Robson, uh, Philip Robson, acted for Doncaster Council, Peter Village for the appellant. Um, I made the mistake of asking Philip what his views were about the case. So if anybody wants a longer version of this, and I mean a much longer version of this, just get in touch with Philip. He's delighted that uh, he won this one. It was a proposal in the green belt, uh, but essentially uh, landscape, uh, so decision of Madam Inspector Malloy, after an eight-day inquiry, talking about uh, needs uh, for additional crematoria facilities within uh, Doncaster. Uh, but Madam Inspector Malloy found this was the, in the wrong place. The landscape impact assessment overstated, sorry, understated the effect and that the alternative sites assessment were, was looking in the wrong part of uh, Doncaster. But apart from that, it was a great proposal. Essentially, very special circumstances were not proven in relation to this Greenbelt scheme. It does really mean that for this sort of case, which is um, quite a complicated case in terms of issues such as highways, uh, where you have uh, a catchment area based upon a 60% of normal travel uh, speeds, etc. cetera, number, number of fairly sh uh, um, difficult points to get to grips with. But the fundamentals are that if you're going to run a need case, uh, for a green belt site, you need to make sure that you're addressing the specific needs in the specific area. And although there's no policy to demonstrate alternative sites, you better have a look in the area which is best located to meet the needs, even if that's in the green belt. But the case isn't important for any of that. The case is important because it's the best use of euphemism of any case I've ever read at, at any stage in 30 years of practice, because the existing Rose Hill crematorium outside Doncaster 
was operating well above its usual 80% comfortable capacity and was being described by Madam Inspector as over-trading, over-trading in the disposal of the dead. That's the best use of euphemism I've encountered in 30 years of practice. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. And without further ado, we hand over to Sasha for his interview with Victoria. Thank you very much, Mary. Victoria, good afternoon again, and, and welcome to We Got Planning News for You. It's great to have you. Let me just introduce you to our audience. You have two hats, one of which we're principally going to focus on, but I think here comes the GNT, Mary, just in time. Um, um, I think, we, Victoria, two hats. First of all, obviously, you have your day job, which you're assistant director of one of the biggest London authorities, the Royal Borough of Greenwich. And also, you are the proud president, current proud president of the Planning Officers Society, which I, I very interested. You've got 2000 members. And actually, unfortunately, you are the only one eligible because I noticed the criteria is you need to have gov.uk in your email generally to be a member of. So the, the four of us would be sensibly precluded. Um, but on, what we want to talk about, I think it's really topical at the moment because one of the major issues facing planning is the pressures and effects on planning officers. But let, let's just deal, before we go down to that, Just can you just tell the audience a bit more about yourself and how you got to your current, current position, both with the planning officers and with Greenwich? Yeah, so I guess um, for starters, I had to do a master's degree to get a recognised RTPI degree. So I prolonged my university education for a full five years, much to the horror of my parents, <laughs> um, and delayed the inevitable getting a job. Um, I graduated when the country was in full swing of the early 90s recession. So it did took a while to secure that first planning job, as there weren't any planning jobs back then. Um, I had no planning experience when I graduated, and this was clearly an impediment to securing a job. Um, Who would have known that at the time when you're 21? Um, I was rejected from one job application because I failed to say I could answer the phone. And the second one, as they said, I would be in charge of their documents library and would I like to act as the librarian? So I learned the lesson very early on that in a poor job market, you do need to answer the job spec and not to grimace when somebody says at an interview, you can tidy up the books at the end of the working day, as my reaction clearly didn't win any hearts and minds in the world of planning then. So anyway, not deterred for that. I um, did some um, work experience in the planning department and quickly landed my first job. So I started working life in uh, South Essex, Greenbelt District Council, Brentwood. And mm. then eventually I moved to London and the rest is history, really. I've worked for four London boroughs, all different, but all very exciting. Which um, are I, which? Which are what? Uh, um, I've got to think about this now. Camden, yeah. <laughs> Newham, Islington and Greenwich in that order. Um, my rise up the career ladder is not revolutionary, but I think early on in your career, you do realise where your interests lie. And mine are definitely in large urban areas. So that's that's key to me. Um, I made my way th up through the ranks of development management and more latterly as a, as assistant director at Greenwich, where I took on policy as well. Um, I've been in Greenwich for five years. It's a fantastic place to work as a public sector worker. So I thought I'd just get that plug in there. Um, and there's lots going on, including a World Heritage Site. Um, I'm the president of the Planning Officer Society this year. And in the previous two years, I was the junior vice and the senior vice president. So you, it takes you three years to, to, to learn how to be a president and then you're let loose for a year. <laughs> Wonderful. OK, well, now tell, tell us to those uninitiated, what, what is the primary purposes of the Planning Officer Society? What, what, how do you see your role and function in the planning system? So I think the primary, pers uh, primary purpose of the Planning Officer Society is to represent the interests and issues of the public sector planners. And it was set up 25 years ago. So actually this year is our jubilee anniversary. And, and as and Sasha, as you've already said, we represent um, 2,000 public sector workers and also 80% of um, local authorities in England. So I think legitimately we can call ourselves the credible voice of public sector planners in England. And I think we operate in three main ways. The first way is we've set up networks of planners, um, both, both subject and regional networks that, we've, that have been established. 
And so, for example, in London, there's there's the planning officer society operates. There's a head of survey, head of planning layer, which is for senior officers, and then there's a development management layer, and then there is um, a spatial policy layer. So it's about getting like-minded people together to swap ideas and best practice. And topical for today's brief, there's also the Novus Group, which represents young planners, gives them a platform, new voices, new ideas, and that's critical to build on the future capacity of the of the of the of local authorities. And then so. POS promotes best practice in planning. We have a relationship with um, such bodies as the Department of Leveling Up and the Planning Inspectorate and the RTPI, and we do meet on a regular basis. And there's also a subsidiary trading company called POS Enterprise, which offers you know, um, training support and services to local authorities and offers critical friend and service review. So it can help people if they're struggling with issues and not sure how to how to how to you know deal with them and then we operate as a think tank and a lobbying organization which which is trying to get excellence in planning practice and we we our main lobbying tool is our manifesto papers and these are think pieces that that we write to tackle topical areas with planning with good planning practice and set out recommendations for improvement and we also um you know we make representations on all you know on all major consultations that come our way so just as a sort of sideline, POS is run by some incredible people. I won't mention them specifically by name because I'm bound to forget some, somebody, but all the details on the website. They offer their time and expertise for the benefit of planning and in doing so, making sure the public sector has a voice and is able to influence the change by governments um, makes the public sector an attractive career, hopefully, for some people. And, you know, this is critical, especially at times where, you know, great change is on the horizon. So, you know, as an organisation, it's, it's, it's critical and it's critical to represent the public sector voice. Mm. Well, in doing that, as you are today representing the public sector, which is obviously, as Chris has already alluded to, a critical element, if not the most critical stakeholder in our system. Well, what do you see as president are the major issues that are facing local authority planning departments and their officers currently? Yeah, so before I came on the programme, I did take some soundings to make sure, you know, what I was saying was reflective of what was going out, you know, what was happening and what, what our members were experiencing. So I think it boils down to sort of key two main issues which, which we're facing. The first one is the continued reduction in local authority planning budget since the late two, you know, the late 2000s recession. It seems to be ongoing. And the second is a shortage of planners, which manifests itself in problems of recruitment, which many of us are experiencing. And then the knock on daily problems that that has in terms of delivering a service without sufficient capacity. And I suspect to many, you know, many, many local planning authority offices out there, it probably feels like a perfect storm. So just turning to the sort of budget reductions as the first issue, Sasha, um, it's not just local planning authorities, it's across councils generally. You know, it's really difficult times and there's difficult decisions that chief exec and councillors have to make. You know, on one hand, you might have planning. On the other hand, you've probably got vulnerable adults and children. So you can sort of see where the, you know, those really difficult decisions that need to be made. So I think in terms of budget cut, it probably feels like, you know, most of us, it's been gone, uh, ongoing for at least 10, 15 years. And for many, it's probably all they've experienced in their careers in a local authority. You know, I've worked for 28 years in the public sector, and I actually can't remember working somewhere where at some point or other we had to make savings. So I think, you know, it's, it's just something that seems to be part and parcel of the job. And I think more recently, there's been a lot written in the professional publications about cuts to planning staff and resources. And this has been, you know, routinely blamed for problems, including performance, which, you know, all the customers will understand that. So the planning magazine recently run a piece where it was saying that um, funding to planning departments has fallen in the last decade with net spend not covered by fee income. And that is the real challenge. So core funding in areas like development management and policy and heritage, the gross spending has gone down by 26% and this, and the net spending by 41% over this 10-year period. So I think, you know, that's more than just cutting the fat out of the system. In reality, the fat was cut out of many local planning authorities a decade ago. So this is just how we have to work. 
Um, the impact of this is to pile the pressure on those who are trying to deliver a good service. Less staff means higher caseloads, means longer hours, and ultimately more pressure and stress. And I think all that's been recently reflected in Sam Stafford's blog, which has been flying around mm. the internet. Mm. Um, most local authority budgets, um, 80% of them go on staffing costs. So there's, there isn't much left to spend on anything else. Um, and then the question has arisen in terms of performance. What's a manageable caseload? 40 applications, depending on the complexity. Many members say they've got a lot more than this. Some of them have got triple figures, which, you know, how, how you juggle that, I don't know. Um, it is a struggle. Um, and then if you look at, you know, plan making, those teams have got smaller and smaller and smaller mm. over the last decade, but they're expected to bring forward complex and complicated development plan. And I think it's probably no wonder that only 40% of the plans are less than five years old out there. And then, mm. you know, another issue is about the specialisms that's dried up over the last decade, heritage, enforcement, sustainability, ecology, all at a time when achieving sustainable de development is key, and particularly how you know, with the urgency of addressing climate change, it's even more acute now. So, you know, set against that mantra of, of performance is king by the government, um, the role in performance, the housing delivery test, it, it really makes it quite difficult to deliver in a local planning authority when, when you have capacity issues. Um, lots of POS members have told me that, you know, being a local planning officer at the moment is frustrating and service users certainly are not happy. And I think there's been lots written in the, um, the planning press about that. And I think it's even been picked up more recently in the House of Lords recent publication on meeting housing demand. And they referred to that report about spending on planning falling by 14.6%, which has caused delays, issues with recruitment and staff and skill shortages. So, that's a bit about the sort of budget and how we fund ourselves. The second issue is about the second issue we face, or the second problem, is about the recruitment crisis. Mm. Um, local authorities are not sheltered from the great resignation that seems to be going on at the moment, but we are bearing the brunt of shortage of planners alongside this and the challenge to make a local authority an attractive place to work. Um, some local authorities have described this as the re revolving door of recruitment. But I think more recently, the revolving doors only been going one way out mm. and it's and it hasn't brought the numbers back in to replace those that are lost. So many local authorities have struggled to uh, recruit and have relied on an agency market probably over the last decade and, and so forth. So I think there's an overall shortage of planners, um, lower pay rates than other sectors, making it not as competitive and attractive. Um, many local authority planners are, are resigning and taking contracting careers. Um, so, you know, that really is a real issue when people are doing that. Um, they can get better pay if they get an hourly rate and it allows them to stay in local government, which is their preferred choice. So they found a way around it, if you like. And then I think one of the critical things is the loss of the overseas market because mm -hmm. of COVID-19 and the travel restrictions. We've lost a whole capacity area that dried up overnight in March 2020 and at the moment hasn't really come back. So I think, Sasha, the, those two issues combined are not making it easy for local, you know, local authority planners. But I think the great thing to say about planners is it shows that they've got real character and tenacity. And even in these adverse times, this, we're still all committed in, in delivering a good job for, for clients and developers, et cetera. So, you know, you know, we're not deterred by it. Well, can I, can I make ask your comment i mean listening to you is absolutely fascinating but i would say as an outsider i mean a caseload of 40 applications is completely ridiculous frankly with the complexity of the average application now i mean as an officer i mean it that alone that sounds like mount olympus to me frankly to deal with 40 applications all the various complexities I mean, it's remarkable, that, frankly, that people are having to deal with that. And that, and as you say, that 40 is probably a floor rather than a ceiling. There are other officers dealing with 60, 80, 100 applications, which is just, I mean, yeah. what you're identifying, and as you say, Sam's talked about this, is there is a crisis. You are asking, as a result of those two issues, the consequences, actually a third issue, which is pretty serious, which is mental health issues, that you're asking people with the addition of COVID to be under the most remarkable level of pressure, which is probably long-term not sustainable? 
yeah, no, and I think that's hit the nail on the head. I think you can you can live you can work in a highly pressurized environment for a short period of time, but not for a long time. And you're right, 40 is the maximum if if it's the simpler cases. Once you start dealing with major applications, you know, you're talking about you can only really juggle a, a handful of those. Um, and and you know, I think it's as a manager, um, and lots of people are saying as managers. It's, there is no magic monetary and there is no magic wand to this, but it's trying to find creative solutions around it. And and also, let's just add in, and I don't, obviously, this is completely um, not subjective to your authority, but of course, the additional one is the activism of members, is members now that are much more interested in the applications and what the officer's view might be. I mean, let's let's live in the real world. I mean, you must have been subject to this at various authorities. Members want to know what's going on and they want to know that their residents' desires and wishes are reflected in what the officers are thinking about applications. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, members are elected by the community, so they've got to be engaged with that community. And, you know, particularly if you have a, a very engaged and articulate community and, and all the boroughs I've worked in have always had that element, um, they will they will pressurise members, they will fill members' mail about with application with representations where they think is a controversial application or something they don't like, and it creates this whole, mm. you know, system of, of having to, you know, an officer not only dealing with neighbours, the applicant and the agent and the members, but and all that, you know, having to explain what's going on, where the case is, you know, what when's it going for a decision? You know, it, it's really difficult. And when you've got, you know, some case officers have said they've got a hundred cases. So if you've got that times a hundred, it, it's a it's a it's a thankless task. It's not only a thank. I mean, I genuinely, I it's impossible. I don't know how anyone could keep abreast of a hundred applications <laughs> at various stages. I mean, if you asked it, I mean, if you think the four of us, we are, all we do is look at a lot of information. I and mean, I think we would all collapse under a hundred different cases if we were asked to look at it. But tell me if, if what, what, I mean, obviously the trouble with the problems you've identified, solutions really are resourcing. I mean, how do, I mean, I think the other shocking thing you said, that 26% and 41% reduction is just incredible. I mean, in the sense, in the context of the complexity of planning is only getting greater and and the issues that are arising. I mean, how does one solve these issues without significant additional funding? Is that possible in your view? So I think there are some solutions. I mean, I suppose, you know, gone are the days when those left can just keep absorbing the work behind when a planner leaves. So I think we have to, we probably have to think more creative about it and how we tackle this. So it's not, there isn't one solution I think that will cure everything. It would be a combination of solutions. And I think in general terms, it's about increasing the number of planners. Um, it's about reviewing the money, both in terms of funding and salary levels, and then looking at the benefits, the culture of organisations, the training and development opportunities. And in doing so, making it more attractive to work at a local planning authority. And I suppose just looking at the solutions, the top one on my list has to be increasing the statutory planning fees. They don't even start mm. to cover the cost of, of processing an application. And I think there have been you know, well over a decade of reluctance to address this issue. Um, whilst we've had inflationary rises, we're not ungrateful to those but they don't actually do a great deal. They don't change the system we're working in. They don't give local authorities more capacity. So I think the planning fees do need a proper, proper overhaul because I think, you know, in terms of funding, that is the only way you're going to cure the problem. Um, and then that will allow us to get more capacity in. But then there's the issue that we need to grow more planners. So there's, so you know, there's, there's, other, there's other things you can do in terms of capacity there's you can grow your own planners we can train planners on on the job send them on day release courses you can you know some universities have sandwich courses so explore year out placement students but please don't chase the ones i'm chasing because i've got that first um then um it helps but they're in expert they're the inexperienced planners so 
it's great that we're getting people in the start of the system, but it's that missing middle that's causing a real problem at the moment, I think. Um, and then IT can play a solution in terms of streamlining some of the work we can do, but it's a small area, I think. Um, there are many programs out there that are looking at artificial intelligence to look at streamlining validation, for example, and that'll play a bit role and it'll free up your professional officers to use their skills and experience in a better way, what they're trained up to do, rather than tell an agent, actually, you forgot to redline the site properly. That's not a good use of their skills. Um, the other one is about reviewing pay grades. But, you know, we are constrained working in the local authority by local authority pay grade structure. And I think we all accept that when we work for a local authority. We're not in it to make ourselves rich. But I think it would be fair to say we should be able to offer a, a fair pay rate for a qualified professional. And that might also help to reverse the current trend we're seeing, which is permanent permanent staff leaving to take on agency jobs, which is you know, the best way to describe that is that's just thoroughly depressing when you sat there in the local authority and somebody says, well, I'm off now, but I'm off to work. I'm off to go and temp in another agency in another local authority. It's that, that's just, that shows really the system is at breaking point when people are doing that. And then I think there are other ways you can look at it, you know, retention and recruitment packages, market supplements, golden hellos, that all costs money. So they all lead back to looking at the statutory fees, really. Um, and then I think most of us, you know, over the last decade have explored ways that we can bring in additional income that's non-statutory. So through planning performance agreements or through running, you know, paid pre-app services. But you do need staff to be able to deliver on the commitments you make when you take that money in. So I think, you know, that's key. And then also just make, looking at, at local authorities, trying to make them um look at the career development and the training opportunities and I think that's when you've got a strapped budget and there's too much work it's often the first thing that falls away but I think it's that is really important now and particularly when we're all you know part rem, remote working and especially if you're a junior planner because you're missing out on that being able to absorb things in an office mm -hmm. and pick up things unintentionally just by listening um, so I think you've really got to push the training and development aspect. And I think, you know, that's really difficult when we don't really have a budget. But I think if you think creatively about it, there, there are lots of free events out there. There's a planning advisory service that offers a lot of things that can be done. Most chambers offer to their clients seminars, um, as do planning consultants. So if you've got contacts there, you know, try and get yourself on their lists. And there's some excellent free training courses out there. Um, and, it, and I think it's more than just getting planners to move up the skill ladder from, you know, majors to, you know, from minor householders to minors to major applications. It's about getting them, you know, to set up a, a good career pathway. They can broaden the skills, um, increase the management experience and, and, you know, really have this proper training path and development path for people, which I think, you know, consultants, when I speak to people in the consultancy, they're really good at doing that. Um, but local authorities need to get better at doing that. And I think going back to increasing the statutory fees, it will give us that additional um, funding to be able to get that back on track, I think. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Let me open up to the audience and let I mean to to Mary to the other participants Mary would you like to ask Victoria your question I'd be very happy to ask Victoria my question but may I just observe what an articulate lady you are and what a very inspiring um professional person you are um and I take my hat off to you actually I really do um so I actually, my question was was just quite simple and personal. And I just wanted to understand what inspired you in the first place to become a planner. Oh, goodness. Um, I, so I guess what inspired me would be, um, well, it was my interest and enthusiasm in geography and how humans interact with their environment. And it probably resonates with many planners out there because probably the majority of us have geography degrees at some point. Um I hadn't really heard of many careers in the built environment, apart from, say, architecture and surveying. Um, and then you look at university courses and see what you might fancy doing. And I came across planning. I thought, I wonder what that is. So I spent a few days in my local planning authority 
And it seemed interesting enough, but at that time, I didn't really want to leave geography. So I ended up doing a joint degree in geography and planning at Birmingham. And I think at the time, that was the only place that offered that combination. But it was a, it, it, I didn't have to leave the geography bit. I could do the mm. planning. If I liked mm. it, then it sort of said you stood me in good, good stead. So I guess, you know, I guess in terms of being inspired, um, I suppose the reason I eventually decided to pursue a career in planning was it blended that interest in geography, but also allows you to have a social conscience. I think it sounds very altruistic. It's not meant to be, um, but it's about trying to improve people's lives. And I think planning enables you to deal with change and to see the positive outcomes of, of what that can do and what you can do in a, a daily basis for, for people in your job. Um what I like about London boroughs is I've worked is that they're all busy urban regeneration areas that throw up lots of in, in, interesting issues, both locally and nationally, because they're in London, so they're on the national stage. But I also like the her, heritage aspect, particularly, particularly of the last two boroughs, so Greenwich and Islington. You know, cities are living organic places, and I think the most interesting areas reflect all stages of growth and development. So I think, you know, that's what inspires me on a daily basis. Well, well done you. And I, 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 I reckon this is your first class um, advertisement for, for planning. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you, Sasha. Brilliant. Right, Paul, what's your question, Victoria? Oh. Well, Victoria, first of all, can I apologise that you've got a little bit of a sound effect from my dog uh, about five minutes ago. The reason for that is the joyous news that my son got a lift home uh, with uh, a girl called Sophia. Uh, and I'm going to ask for better and uh, particulars later on. And that means I've been able to open my beer. So I'm a really hey. funny. So <laughs> one Yorkshire person to another. Cheers. Um, and I endorse everything that Mary's just said in relation to it, to inspiration. I'm going to pick Thank up you. an audience question, if I may, and sort of tweet the question I was going to ask of you, because I was going to ask you about resources. But one of the points that's been made by a number of people uh, on the, the on the chat is about ring fencing resources. Mm -hmm. And from a, a, a barrister's perspective, when the QC system was about to be abandoned, uh, it was reinstated, but they said, well, it has to be self-financing. So applications, therefore, had to fund the system that we operate in. It's always struck me that the same should be true of the planning service. But if you're going to put applications up, you need to ring fence them and hypothecate it, as they would say in Whitehall. Yeah. And then we could have the system that we want it, it, without any cost to the public purse. It seems crazy to me. Thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, it, I think... It, uh, Rather than sounding like a stuck record, I really do think the statutory fees need to be reviewed and need to reflect the cost of running and delivering a planning service. And I think, you know, one, one way of making that palatable to people out there is that the, the money that comes in then is ring-fenced to the local authority. Um, and so then we can use it on, you know, improving our capacity um, expanding our skills and getting, you know, heritage, sustainability, climate change. They're all areas that are on the up and up. And we're all fairly strapped, I think, in the skills market for those particular areas. So I think it would be to ring fence the fees to be used for the local planning authority. It was nice when two Yorkshire folk agree. <laughs> Cheers, yeah. Victoria. Thank you. Brilliant. Now, Chris, Chris, before we go on, please tell us what that animal is that you thought it was behind you. Is it a horse or a cow? OK. It's a it's a farmyard scene. Oh, uh, sweet. Early, oh. early stages of a planner, that is. <laughs> My diversity net gain. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Can I just say, uh, Vicky, I completely agree. Uh, geographers rock. OK. And just rule the world, really. Yeah. Uh, law is not that interesting <laughs> at university. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I've been asking lots of people. I asked Ashley Baldwin, who is the RTPI chair in the West Midlands. Uh, he's also the head of planning at Nuneaton and Bedworth. He said, it's only good having this increased fees if they're ring fenced, exactly mm -hmm. what you said. But another problem is he can generate income through PPAs, uh, performance agreements. But he has to think, have I got the resources to actually put that person in place and deliver the service I've got. And then speaking to my sister, she said they've got a real recruitment problem. And another problem they have is a huge amount of abuse on social media. Planners getting a load of abuse 
she tells me jokingly, of course, because uh, she's got a good sense of humour. But, you know, the number of people who say she's responsible for deaths on the roads because she granted a planning application, which increased the traffic. I mean, something should be done about that. There's absolutely no way that is acceptable. Um, my question, though, is about the members. Uh, the members, obviously, all planning officers have to be extremely careful what they say about members. But there's a situation, isn't there, where the members refuse an application. My sister's view is they should then be the ones who answer the questions. And I know a lot of other officers feel that, that they're the ones who made the decision, but they don't. An officer does it. It takes up a huge amount of time. They have to prepare because they know one of us is going to ask them questions about everything. And surely, really, members have to take some responsibility, either to give the evidence or to pay, if not a surcharge on a cost application, a percentage of the cost application to make them think carefully about the decisions they're making. <laughs> Vicky, before you answer that, it's known at the planning bar, worst moment in our careers is when we call a member and we put them in the box to be cross-examined by one of our brethren because it's a magical mystery tour. Anyway. <laughs> I think, yeah, I disagree, Sasha. I've done it. I did it for Stratford a lot. I think you can prepare them. Just don't give them housing number requirements. <laughs> <laughs> but but sit, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Because that when members make that decision, we're seeing more and more of that. That's a huge resource implication for the planning department, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm probably fairly accepting that that happens. I think overturns are always disappointing for officers. And, and, it, and it, but it, I suppose as long as the decision is taken correctly and the reasons are justified, then I think that reflects local democracy in action. Um, as to putting, as to getting members involved in um, appeals, I think if it if it's um, a, an, a, an issue that you know really resonates with them, some members are quite happy and prepared to come and not not be cross examined because I think probably you know most professional planners probably quake under cross examination when they're faced with a barrister. Um, but if you put a lay person into that situation, I think it. I think I think it's probably slightly unfair, but I think quite a lot of members that I've had experience with are more than happy to turn up to inquiries or hearings and 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 talk from their heart about the reasons that they think that development X is unacceptable. Um, I'm I'm not sure that I would go as far as you're suggesting to um, put a surcharge on them um, and, and and make them pay if they don't get that right because I think. You know, it's a reflection of local democracy. Um, I think it's incumbent on planning officers to make sure that their trainers, their sorry, their councillors are fully equipped when they're in a planning um, committee to properly deal with those applications and to understand those applications and not to make snap judgments. So it's about making sure they're properly prepared. Um, making sure that you've got ongoing training so they understand what they need to do to make a planning decision. Because at the end of the day, they're elected lay people. So I think it's probably incumbent on us to make sure they're properly prepared. But you will always get overturns in a in a in a mm. you know framework that we work in. It's just making sure that when they happen, they are properly justified on planning grounds, which you know they're not always, but it's to help them and can advise we, them victoria before we finish can we I hope rob can work his magic and can we zoom charlie back in to ask his question which is obviously pre-recorded rob hi victoria i'm so sorry i can't be with you for the live show but i've got one question i'd be delighted to hear your answer when i watch it back on youtube later on which which is this is um it's, it's been said that the the building beautiful agenda and the changes to the framework national model design code and the local design code that's to come is going to uh, be particularly demanding for local authorities to implement given that many of them don't have an internal urban design or, or architect uh, resource uh, what's your view on that and uh, what if you think there is a problem what do you think the the answer is uh, does does government need to fund local authorities to recruit uh, officers who have the, that expertise yeah, I mean, I suppose in answer to that is I think I think um, there is more capacity needed um, to deliver on that agenda in terms of urban design and architect skills and experience. Um, 
we need to increase the in-house skills. I think one of the things that has probably dwindled over the last decade is um, conservation and urban design teams. Mm. Um, you know, many authorities are left with one or two people if they're lucky. Um, and I think we really do need to address that. And I think increasing the planning fees will allow us to get that specialism in. I think, you know, there's been a few recent appeals where they've been upheld on, on poor design. So clearly it's resonating with the planning inspectorate now in terms of that agenda. I think we can upskill um, offices in, internally, but I think when it comes to the bigger schemes, you do need, you know, urban design and architecture experience to really make a difference in shaping and influencing those schemes and to hold court with an applicant's team who will have architects and urban designers falling out of the pockets. Um, so it's it's been properly skilled to be able to hold a proper conversation and try shape those skills. And I think the only way to do that is, is to increase the in-house capacity. Um, that's a challenge until the planning fees. Um, there's a theme here with the planning with the planning mm. fees, isn't there? Um, until the planning fees are reviewed, that will still be a challenge for most local planning authorities. So at the moment, we we have to be creative about how we retain urban design skills. So one way to do it is through planning performance agreements, through your major applications. Another way is a bit like we do uh, viability reviews, which is we ask the developer to pay for us to get somebody in to assess the scheme. And, and most major developers are happy to do so. I'm sure they would prefer it if the fees allowed us to do that. But I think it's being creative about what we can do now, but what we need to do in the future to properly address that agenda. And, you know, we've introduced now national models of design codes and design codes are a big thing in flavour. So, so we do need that skill in house. Well, thank you so much. I, I, we could frankly go on for the rest of the evening. <laughs> Victoria, you've been magnificent. Truly, thank you. Mary, back to you. Uh, Victoria, thank you before, so much. Before Mary dives in, just to let you know, in terms of the questions that have been asked by our audience, what we'll do is we'll make sure that those are passed on to you. Uh, so Rob, our IT guru, will make sure those are passed on so you can deal with yes. those offline. So thank you. Sorry to interrupt, Mary. No, no, not at all. I was going to say we've had the most wonderful um, audience participation in this episode. It's absolutely fantastic. And I would just like to say to all those who are listening, thank you so much for your very interactive contribution. It's really um, insightful and uh, it's great. It's really great. So thank you very much, Victoria. And we are back in on the 17th of February. And our next guest is Timothy Crawshaw, the new president of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Thank so you. until then, stay safe and goodbye from Have We Got Planning News for You. Thank yeah. you very Cheers, much everyone. for inviting Thanks, me. Victoria. Thanks, bye. <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Oh, Thank you. I've had a lovely day. And I've learned a lot about what... Uh, uh, QC planners do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need a different panel. <laughs> <laughs>